I'll, I'll just start with my presentation because it's actually, once again, too many slides for this slot. Um, it's the first time I'm giving a talk where I'm not talking about something I'd hacked in OpenBSD. This is, for once, how I'm using OpenBSD for, for my work in my company. Um, I got frequently approached by people asking, like, how do you use it? And well, after telling little bits every now and then, I decided to make it a talk. Um, so that's what it is. One of my companies, um, DSWS, the roots go far back to 1986. Um, the internet was different back then. We are basically an ISP since 1988. The first two years were slightly different. Um, we do offer all kinds of hosting. We don't do internet access except for the offices in our building. And um, we largely run on OpenBSD pretty much since, not exactly since the beginning, but shortly thereafter. Um, hosting ISP networks are kind of interesting from my point of view, at least. Um, I think it's one of the most hostile network environments you can find in the world. Um, there's a couple of complications that you don't find in, in more regular networks like office networks. You do have a 100% uptime or availability requirement or as close as possible. There is no, nobody, no everybody goes home at 5 p.m. and you can screw the network until the next morning. That doesn't work in that environment. Um, also, almost everything is internet facing. And to make this even more complicated, you do have hosts on your network that are not under your control. And you know it. I'm not talking about taking over hosts. Um, also, you quite frequently have to deal with denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks. So that leads to the requirement for heavy network segmentation. You want to isolate your own boxes, like your own infrastructure, from your customer controlled hosts. But you also want to isolate your customers from each other. So that in turn, that's not my phone, is it? No. Um, that in turn leads to many, many, many VLANs. And that in turn um, makes the switch configuration that's the layer two handling quite complex. We do apply a <laughs> surprise here. Firewalls as points of policy enforcement basically everywhere. So firewalls are not just between the internet and the servers. They are also between the different customer VLANs. So why OpenBSD? Initially, we were running on Linux. And uh, in 1998 or 99, I don't quite remember exactly, we got a denial of service attack that the host handled really, really, really poorly. Basically, it, it didn't do anything anymore. At the same time, a colleague told me that they just switched their name servers to FreeBSD and were so happy about it. I was like, well, let's have a look at the BSDs then. So I looked at free and net and open. Um, I believe I didn't really look at NetBSD, but I don't remember why. Basically, I looked at free and open and liked open better. And uh, the more I used it, the more I liked it. So that's what I sticked with. And well, started to use it for everything, not just that one task. Um, over all the years, why are we so happy with OpenBSD? Foremost, and this is really the biggest reason for me, no surprises. Whatever I do, I know what's going to happen. And there's no surprising, well, I had a Cisco that crashed on me when I typed show version. I've never <laughs> seen that on OpenBSD. <laughs> uh, off topic. <laughs> We don't have that much time. <laughs> so for our use cases, OpenBSD has been rock, 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 rock solid. Um, there were stability issues in the early days, but you also have to take into account that, that around the millennium, servers were not of the quality we have today. Uh, rack mount servers were something new back then. Like most, most ISPs back then had, had shelves and stacks of sunboxes. Um, another bit is the very, very efficient systems administration. And sysadmin time is an expensive resource. So limiting that is very valuable. The same default saves us a lot of time. Like, um, am I allowed to make fun of FreeBSD? Installing FreeBSD and pushing buttons for half an hour after install, sorry, that doesn't cut it. Um, we don't even have a need for custom kernels or to, to compile we al compile almost nothing ourselves. We almost exclusively use the OpenBSD supplied binaries, as, as in those that Theo builds. 
And we do use the stable bin patches and packages that MTR thankfully provides. That is very, very useful. The package tools are a big pro for me. Um, our policy is that there is not a single binary on any system that is not in base or a package. It's in base or a package, period, no exceptions. We don't build ports ourselves, we just use the one that OpenBSD provides. And um, we do have a handful, or maybe two handful, of, of custom ports and packages for, for in-house written software that's not good enough to publish. <laughs> and uh, we have a couple where we either modified a port or did a port that is so weird, strange, special, that it just doesn't make sense to commit this to the OpenBSD ports tree. And again, no surprises. The package tools really always just do what they're supposed to do. I have never, ever found them puking on me or leaving corrupted databases or anything. Well, at least not in a way that they couldn't fix it. Upgrades on OpenBSD, at least today, are close to trivial, fortunately. The way we do it, and this is not the way I recommend to be quite clear on that, the way we do it is unpack the new binaries inline and new kernels and then reboot. Um, the one of the big disadvantages here is you have to know when that doesn't work. So sometimes you've got to boot the new kernel first. And again, don't follow this route unless you're in for a lot of pain and manage a lot of hosts, because if you're just doing this for a handful of hosts, it'll never pay out. Um, Sysmerge taking care of the config files is really, really nice, the base config files at least. Um, also, most of the time it does its job and I don't have to do anything manually, we like that. Um, the package tools upgrading all packages, it almost always works without any manual intervention. And if there is manual intervention required, this is usually due to the package software itself having major changes which also in turn means you know this upfront. So, no surprises. We do have the process of upgrading this largely automated and I've been asked, so I'll answer this upfront, I'm not going to share this because it's not good enough. It makes many, many assumptions that are true for our network, but it's not general purpose. So, I'm not going to publish this. Performance, because everybody knows OpenBSD is slow, <coughs> in our experience, and I do realize this is our experience and not covering the entire world, um, the performance we got from OpenBSD always was good or better than that. It's always been good enough for what we do at least. Um, if you compare this to other OSs, we're basically on par. Sometimes a little bit slower, sometimes a little bit faster. You get the idea. So it's really not, not a case or a point that you have to watch out for. Um, over all the years, I remember exactly one case where we had a performance problem that could be attributed to OpenBSD, and I'm not even sure anymore whether that was not a problem with the driver for the rate card we used back then. Um, that was a busy database server and had, had uh, lack of I.O. problems. Um, Basically, whatever we throw at, whatever task we use it for today, web servers, firewalls, routers, load balancers, mail servers, databases, application servers, DNS, and whatnot, never ever really had performance problems that you could attribute to OpenBSD. Now, of course, we do have performance problems now and then, and that's usually customers calling, my little web app runs so slow on your servers, can you make your servers faster? And usually, after closer look, it's something utterly stupid that no OS can fix. I recently had a case where a customer complained about his VM being too slow, and can I have more virtual CPUs? I'm sure, get four instead of one, doesn't solve the problem. Well, they used a little voting thing, and whenever somebody went to that page, they displayed the number of votes already given. Well, select star from the table and then use PHP to count is not very efficient. <laughs> And there's nothing you can do on the OS level to fix that. And there's, nothing you, there's nothing on the OS level you should do to fix that. 
Um, security obviously is pretty, pretty important in this environment. As I said, it, everything's internet facing. A compromised system means the services are down. Customers don't like that. A compromised system can mean there's data theft. Customers don't like that. Might also get them into legal trouble. And well, the, whenever the system is compromised, the customers are unhappy. And unhappy customers are not good for us because that's usually more work. And we don't like more work. Um, with everything facing the internet, the attack surface is gigantic, right? Basically, every service is reachable for almost everybody. So security here is absolutely critical. And as an ISP, you do have to run very, very questionable third-party code. There is no way around it, unfortunately. So we do have to offer PHP because that's what customers are using. Do you trust PHP? I don't. Do you trust the PHP code that some web hipster wrote that people run? <laughs> but we got to run it. There's no way around it. Customers can upload whatever they want, unfortunately. Well, that's how this business works. Um, same thing for Java, I mean, seriously. Trust Java a little bit more than PHP. I disagree. Ever since Oracle took over, it's worse. Oh. Before, it might have been a tiny little bit better. I just talked to a customer who wanted to use a Java thingy for its central access control. Each and every door and each and every office over the world, each and every computer log, and even authorizing bank transfers written in Java. I talked them out of it, fortunately. I don't think PHP would be an improvement. Well, PHP would be an improvement, but seriously, access control to everything you have, including financial transactions, running stacks of shit, stacks of shit, stacks of shit. Really? Even CEOs understand that. Just remember, just in my blog, I have at least three cards that run Java. Yeah, my condolences. In this case, they wanted to use cell phones that connect over Wi-Fi to the door controllers. <laughs> Marketing-driven company. So with. With having to run all this very questionable third-party crap, the mitigation techniques, exploit mitigation, is so important these days. And sorry, pun again, FreeBSD ignoring the problem space is a shame. Fix it. And I know there's work ongoing, and I applaud that. Um, yeah. The randomization, of course, always helps. But the mitigation is really what cuts it for us. Um, on the security front, OpenBSD never ever has let us down. In running that stuff for 15 plus years on hundreds of hosts, we never ever had a single host being compromised. We did have a couple of cases, well, couple is too little. We did have cases where a customer controlled and installed and managed web apps have been abused. The most classical case, some improperly secured form mail kind of thing, so spammers are using that to send out email. Fortunately, we noticed these things very quickly, but yeah. Again, what can you do? Customers can upload whatever they want. And again, there's no way at the OS level to prevent these. However, there were many, many security issues that <laughs> did cause problems and, and compromised hosts for other ISPs, other familiar companies, where we were saved by either the OpenBSD mitigation techniques or changes that our ports team did to the software in question by applying patches in ports. Noticeably, the, uh, what was the name of that PHP extension that we have in ports? Had Su 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 or something? Yeah. That, that has helped us a lot and prevented a lot of PHP problems affecting us and our customers and our sleep. So in general, OpenBSD for us just does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't surprise us. I love that. It doesn't annoy us, usually. Uh, it doesn't cause us extra work. It doesn't wake us up at night because things just work. I also recently figured out, sorry, Antoine, I just figured out why OpenBSD is so popular in, in, in France. It keeps working when they are on strike again. <laughs> Um, with running a network of so many OpenBSD hosts, um, 
a high automation level is a must. Also, the ISP business doesn't exactly have these high margins that you can employ shitloads of sysadmins to do everything manually. So high automation level absolutely required. In our case, this is our very own system developed for more than 15 years now, um, mostly written in Perl with some shell code and yeah, that's it mostly. Um, it does deal with much, much, much more than just overriding system management. It's also not strictly limited to OpenBSD, but support for other OSs is minimal. Um, of course, it deals with all our machines and all our VMs. If I ever lose that database, I have a problem. I don't even know whether the hardware belongs to us or the customer. So we have many copies of that. Um, besides machines and virtual machines, of course, it deals with everything that has a network connector and everything that has a power connector. Need to track everything. Um, for, for network, it's quite clear switch management is the big thing. For power, it's mostly the power controllers that allow customers to turn their machines on and off remotely. Um, there's, well, and UPSs and PDUs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the console, serial console server infrastructure also is quite involved. Um, Obviously, services, many, 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 including setting up the monitoring for those services, because monitoring is critical in an ISP environment. You want to know that your stuff broke before your customers notice. You have to integrate, or we have to integrate, bi billing and a little bit of bookkeeping, because, again, we need automation. And that also means we have to deal with wages and tax pre-announcements and export the records to the tax advisor frequently. So it's not all that hardcore low-level OS management anymore. And of course, you have to supply web interfaces for customers because everything customers can do themselves saves you support calls and support is expensive. Sign-up processes for new customers are a specific problem with that because you kind of have to try to make sure you're not falling for some spammer who tries to rent a server for one month, never pays, and by the time you shut it down, they've, they've made their use of it. There are so many attempts for that. We fortunately never fail for one, but there's an attempt every second week or so. Okay, I average four or five a month. Pardon? Yeah. I average four or five a month, but that may not be worthwhile. Yeah, we got a few less, but... <laughs> So verifying new customers actually is a problem, especially with fully automated sign-up processes. So um, how does that system work? Basically, we have a periodic task on each machine running once an hour that connects to the central management hosts, um, retrieves the desired configuration bits, applies them, reconfigures the machine as required. Um, it does include management of SSH keys. So we push an SSH known hosts file to each and every machine that knows about all the SSH keys in all of our network. And at the same time, um, the uh, machine sent back the SSH host keys so that we can distribute them to all the other machines. Um, also, for all the automation, a quite extensive set of authorized hosts files limited to specific commands and stuff like that. So that's, act that's actually very <laughs> involved. Um, it doesn't just deal with that, it also sends inventory information back. So I have full tracking of each and every disk, including when it changed machines, if it ever did, and stuff like that. So lifetime monitoring, including the number of cycles the backup tapes got. Everything monitored, and you need that. At the same time, it takes care of keeping the machines up to date in, with regard to security fixes. So it automatically applies the bin patches and uh, stable package updates. So if there's a problem now, it'll be fixed in an hour without me touching it. I like that. Um, if I would start this from scratch today, I would certainly not start from zero. I would use one of the orchestration frameworks. And if you are in that position, I absolutely recommend looking at the or orchestration frameworks and make them fit for your needs. Don't start from scratch. However, back in 2000s, around 2000s, there was no such thing available. The only thing around really was CF Engine, and that never ever was an option. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are still sticking with it because changing that now would be a lot of work. I suspect that will still happen one day, but so far there's no pressing need, and 
We have so much on the other stuff on the plate that is more interesting or more urgent. These frameworks definitely are more powerful, versatile, and comprehensive than what we have. Ours is tailor-made for our needs and doesn't deal with anything else. But it does the job and works fine for us, so why change? We do make extensive use of the auto-install feature in OpenBSD that we gained, like what, five releases ago or so? Um, for a long time, I couldn't really use it for our purposes because the uh, disk allocation, the default layout, just didn't cut it for us. Um, when were we in things last year? Early last year? So earlier last year, I added custom template support to disk labels so that you can give it, well, yeah, the template for disk partitioning. We basically never allocate all of the disk. We allocate a, a little bit, basically what we need, and leave the rest as wiggle space. So when you run, of course, with margins. But so if you run out of space five years later in one of the partitions, you've got room to grow. And admittedly, more modern file systems get this better than FFS, but that's a different topic. The auto partition template file, just like all the other answer files, are fetched over HTTP. Um, we do use the, the OpenBSD installer extension, it's uh, the site xx.tgz set, and executing the contained install.site at the end of the installer. Um, in that, I copied the ask functions from the regular installer, so they automatically benefit from the, the fetch the response file and work with that. So we can automate this in the very same way. We do use a dedicated and completely isolated VLAN for installations. It's not even routed to the internet. There's one little hole that I poked. It can phone home to the OpenBSD host to say, I'm freshly installed. And that's it. Um, that obviously also has the netboot infrastructure. Um, I don't remember when, when, the la when was the last time that I booted, initially booted a machine from a USB stick or a CD or something. Netboot is so much easier if you have the infrastructure. So for, for the auto-install scheme to work the way we use it, we need to know the MAC addresses up front. This is fortunately very easy these days because every server that ever reached us over the last five, six, seven, ten years has a barcode sticker somewhere with a MAC address. So we use a couple of barcode readers and don't have to type anything. Our system then reconfigures the DHCP servers to, uh, to have a static MAC address to IP mapping. And with that, our backends know which machine just booted, right? The response files for the auto installer aren't actually files, it's a CGI using the newer OpenBSD HTTPD, little Perl fast CGI thing that talks to our backend databases, it fetches the desired configuration bits. I keep saying it takes us about 15 minutes to get a new server live, which is roughly appropriate, and that includes unpacking and racking it. So, fun? Well, right now it's probably 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, right now I have somebody else do the racking, of course. <laughs> Five minutes per arm? I need, I need more arms then. Well, the point here is it's very quick and very efficient and re requires very little manual intervention. And again, everything that has to be done manually is expensive. So um, for virtual machines, the process is even nicer uh, because you don't have to unpack and rack anything. Um, the deployment is 100% automated. Um, you do need to generate a MAC address here because there is none. So we do that. And of course, it's random and not just plus one. Um, we retrieve the configuration bits from the back end, and in the case of VMs, that includes more than for physical machines because you need to know how many CPU cores, how much RAM, disk space initially, and all that kind of stuff. Um, once we did that, again, we have to reconfigure the DHCPDs, but this time it has to be almost real time because the VM is going to be fired up like two seconds later. We have to reconfigure the console server front ends um, before the machine fires up for the serial console emulated over the network 
For the physical servers, this is easier. By the time you plug the cable in, you tell the system wh where you plugged it in and you're done, right? But these just show up on the fly. And you have to reconfigure the VNC proxy. I wrote a VNC proxy in Perl, non-blocking, <laughs> single process, um, that allows customers to access the VGA console for those that find serial too hard. Look there. <laughs> um, to be quite honest, our VMM is not there yet. It'll, it'll be there soon. Um, this is based on uh, Linux KVM. Yeah. I found a Linux distro that is very open BSD like it's Alpine. I still don't like it very much, but it's bearable. Um, when I fired up the installer for the first time, I was like, wait a second, I know these questions. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of them are word by word copied from our installer, and that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> then it offers, then it asks, do you want to install NTP? I'm like, yeah, well, I don't want this pet. <laughs> Which NTP? The open NTP? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So for a Linux, it's quite sane, but. Um, of course, I want to get rid of that and run OpenBSD. Um, the uh, KVM hosts are in an isolated VLAN that is not even routed. There is a tiny, tiny little HTTP proxy that allows them to connect back to the hosts that supply the package updates for them, and that's it. Otherwise, you cannot get out of that VLAN. Um, that VLAN only has the VM hosts and our VM controllers, and that's it. So um, back to the auto install with the VM. The actual install works obviously the very same way it works with uh, physical machines. At the end, our installer site does one last HTTP request to the install server, requesting slash install done, just to signal back that, hey, I'm done in about two seconds. I'm done unmounting my file system, shut down the VM, and restart it after putting it into the destination VLAN. Because for installation, it's in that, <coughs> sorry, for the installation, it's in that isolated install VLAN. And of course, finally, mail a report to the customer. Um, surprise, we actually use OpenBSD for firewalling. I've heard good things about it. <coughs> we always, not a single exception, well, me at home, but that doesn't count, uh, always in pairs, failover config, car, PF sync, etc, etc. Um, we always put the policies on the VLAN interfaces, as in the interfaces facing the, the VLANs containing the servers. On the interfaces facing the routers, the outside world, we only do some spoof protection. The advantage here being is if, you want to talk, if VLAN A wants to talk to VLAN B, it has to pass the outbound policy for VLAN A and then the inbound policy for VLAN B, so they are properly isolated. The confusing bit is that the outbound policy is pass in rules because it's the interface view. But, well, you get used to it. Um, another surprise here, I'm actually running VGPD. Um, I'm not going into much detail here because Benno is going to do this tomorrow at 2.45, tomorrow afternoon. So for all the glory network networking details in a different network but similar techniques, go to Benos talk tomorrow. Um, we do run OSPFD, but to be honest, our network is simple enough that we would get away without it. It's just convenience. Um, all the routers, surprise, are in a failover config as well. Um, we do have fiber runs to two remote sites where we are buying the bandwidth and do many peerings. A um, couple of public, couple of private. The remote sites only have networking gear. So foremost switches and for one of the fiber runs some Sonet gear because that's Sonet. The other I love even more. It's an eight kilometer dark fiber. So get the long range optics, plug them into your switch, done. Lovely. It had one outage in, what is it now? Over a decade. Somebody pulled the wrong patch cable in the middle. That's it, once, more than 10 years. Um, layer two, as I mentioned, is quite complex for us because we have to deal with all the VLANs and it's a quite dynamic environment. It changes all the time. 
So again, automation. To make this even more complicated, we have several VLAN namespaces <laughs> as in groups of switches because of the limitations that switches often have with the number of VLANs they support. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. One of these days when the switch D that Reich's been talking about and appropriate hardware being around, that'll be solved. But until that happens, we'll have to run separate namespaces. Um, our system uses the, the switch and CLI to configure them. I initially looked at, at using SNMP writes to configure them, and after about 15 minutes of looking at that, I was exactly, no fucking way. <laughs> Um, we use SNMP the way that everybody does, fetch the, sp uh, the, the port utilization statistics and that kind of stuff, but not for writing. Um, our system abstracts the differences between the different switch models and vendors, so I don't have to remember all the glory details. Um, basically, all we have to do manually when we're plugging a cable into a port, we have to tell the system what is connected to that port. Well, can't get around that really. And then the backend knows which VLANs the machine needs and configures it appropriately. So um, the switch conflicts are very complex for other reasons. Um, we kind of obviously need something. They usually call it port security or MAC lock lockdown. <coughs> Basically prevent the switch from learning MAC addresses on ports once they, well, once they have a MAC address set once you know which machine is connected with which MAC address, stop learning new ones on that port. Um, we also filter out CARP announcements because CARP is not 100% replay safe. That's technically impossible. CARP is much better than the other alternatives, but as I said, not 100%. And um, when you're interfacing exchange point networks, they hate to see strange traffic, so they'll complain if they see CARP stuff. Um, these days, I usually run CARP in unicast mode, so we don't even have that problem, but in some scenarios, you can't. We also have to do with LACP and RSTP, rapid spanning tree, and we do want to turn all ports off when nothing is connected. As a precaution against us being stupid and just because it's the right thing to do. Our mail platform is quite interesting, I think. Um, email became so complicated, so incredibly complicated. Install a mail server, put it to the internet, just doesn't cut it anymore. And this is foremost thanks to the spam problems. So with the scale we are dealing, um, it's not a mail server and a backup. It's, it's the MX front ends for receiving email from the outside. It's the SMTPDs that the customer, customers put into their mail clients, the customer drops. Uh, obviously, for three IMAP, and well, you've got to offer some web mail. Then you have storage systems. You need an authentication backend, and the mail routing configuration isn't exactly trivial either. Um, the most complex bit in that, surprise, all the anti spam measures, which include the policy <coughs> systems uh, that's foremost DMARC and DKM. I'm getting to that in a little bit. Our mail platform is built around with each which is essentially a fork of Qmail LDAP now, which in itself is a fork of Qmail, but it has been de so it's somewhat readable. <laughs> I took that decision in 2000. If I was starting from scratch today, I would use OpenSMTPD and hack it up until it fits my needs. Didn't exist back then, and that was by far the best option we had, and I'm still pretty happy with it, to be honest. Qmail is misunderstood. Qmail is not an MTA. Qmail is a number of building blocks to build your own. So it's like NetBSD. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and don't get me wrong here, NetBSD does awesome things. They're just not very good at making releases. So um, with the mail platform of this size, I tend to think that having your own fork is almost unavoidable because that it's so complex and it's so different in each and every use case. So you're kind of forced to, to fork anyway. And that is a lot of work. Um, of course, for the users, we are not using Unix users. How big, how many actual users do you have on this 
I don't count them. I don't count them. Six digit number, I guess. Okay. It's sometimes hard to tell because many customers, um, we don't really have personal customers, private customers. It's usually companies and it's usually not the smallest ones. Like we have those, like the neighborhood dentist or something. Yes, we have those, but usually it's a little bit bigger companies and they often run their own mail servers. So everything goes through our system, but we don't really see the mailboxes. So how do you count? Pardon? What? <laughs> what? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> see, if, if I was smart enough to be able to write PHP code, I could do that, but. The web hipster Kool-Aid didn't arrive here. Um, so we are using all virtual users. Unix, Unix users just don't cut it. One, because it's too many. Two, and this is the main point, the flexibility requirements. Uh, creating Unix users on a bunch of hosts just to create one mailbox, uh, no. Um, our user accounts are just LDAP objects. And the way this is laid out is really perfect for the ISP use case. I'm not a big LDAP fan, but for this use case, it's really, really nice. If the protocol wasn't so bad, it would be super nice. Um, so user accounts are just LDAP objects, and everything that matters is property. So there's a property that's the path to the mail there if, if uh, the user has a mailbox with us. Um, the mail addresses, yes, more than one usually. Uh, forwarding addresses, autoresponders, account status, whatnot. And of course, and this is Surprise, a big thing, the per user anti-spam configuration. Domains that we are handling mail for, surprise, are also LDAP objects that have a couple of properties, including the per domain anti-spam configs and the keys for DKM. Um, we obviously have multiple LDAP servers because, well, running one and that failing, taking everything out is not desirable. Um, it is fortunately relatively easy because all the front ends only need read access. So um, we are using the LDAP replication, and then that's pretty straightforward and easy. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm running open LDAP because it predates the LDAP from base, and the LDAP D in base lacks a couple of features we need, um, foremost an access control. Maybe one day, I don't like open LDAP, so maybe one day, one problem at a time. <laughs> and this works. So. Um, the the MX is the, the front ends where external mail servers deliver mail to our customers. All but the remote ones just mount the, the mail store area over NFS. Then the remote ones basically, it's a little bit more complex than that, but basically just relay to the local ones. We do have spam the and gray listing host on each and every of those nodes. We don't have them on the firewalls up front. We have them on the actual mail servers using the built-in replication, so the SpamDs share their whitelists. We do use a very custom gray scanner to use this 20, 25 minute window we have to analyze their behavior. Like somebody we've never seen suddenly trying to deliver to a thousand users of which 900 don't exist. Probably not legit. Um, most of the gray listing problems that people have are fortunately solved or not even encountered by us, thanks to volume. So the typical Gmail problem, they reconnect from different IP addresses all the time. Well, with the amount of mail we're handling, they're whitelisted all the time because they talk to us all the time. They never expire. I'm also playing some PF games, but that goes a little bit too far here. Um, I like looking, using the passive OS fingerprinting. <laughs> Um, a Windows host connecting to our MXs has a much higher probability of delivering spam than anything else because it's usually taking over hosts and there aren't many internet connected directly mail sending Windows mail servers. They're usually hidden behind some other boxes. The customer SMTP drops, it's not just one, it's more than one. We have regular bulk mail and relay. The relay goes into the regular, actually, at the moment. Of course, all CARP does redundant. There's some interesting problem you have to solve at this scale when you have customers that send out 
newsletters with hundreds of thousands of recipients or even millions. Legit, we do not tolerate spammers. Um, that fills up your queue and regular email will be delayed because, well, it goes to the end of the queue. Customers don't like that. So what we do, we have per user and per, per session thresholds, and if those are exceeded, the enqueue redirects uh, the mail into the bulk mail instance, which sends the mail out a little bit slower, but foremost, it does not block the queue in the main instances. Our policy demon. <laughs> um, all instances use a small custom NQ program I, I wrote in C for performance reasons, which talks to the policy daemon, which in turn is written in Perl because that will be way too much work in C. Um, the policy daemon takes the decision and the custom NQ then NQs or well, or it doesn't. That's the point here, right? The basic concept is we have to accept and deliver or reject outright. You cannot silently drop email. This is a legal requirement which many get wrong. I also think it's a requirement just out of transparency, fairness. Silently dropping things is not good. There's one exception if the target user, not just the customer, the specific user checks an option, please drop detected spam, then we can silently drop it and it's legal and we do it. But that's the only case. The policy daemon incorporates the spam assassin per modules, like we're not running spam assassin as, as usual, we're just using the same backend modules but incorporated into our own daemon. It does the DKM signing and verification, it does DMARC, authentication results headers, and unfortunately it also does SPF, which is useless by itself and a bad idea, but as input to DMARC it actually is useful. It's also interfacing ClamD for those customers who believe in, in virus scanning, as in snake oil. I don't, but well, customers want it and they pay for it, so fine. It deals with the rate limiting. It has to deal with the per domain and per user anti-spam configuration fetching from LDAP. And well, de dealing with detected spam isn't actually all that straightforward because there's so many options. There's the reject option, but now, what if there's two recipients and one, one has a setting saying, please drop this or reject this, and the other says, deliver it. So you cannot refuse acceptance. In that case is slightly complicated. Um, even with detected spam, you can just mark it in the header for customer zone filtering or do the spam assassin style rewrite to make it safe to display in, in uh, bad mail clients. And one case, surprisingly complex, that's please deliver to the spam folder. Because there you basically just mark and way later in the chain the local delivery agent looks at that marker and delivers it to a different folder. For part three, we just run the QML LDAP one. For IMAP, we run Dovecut, but with the authenticator replaced. And for webmail, we use a customized round cube, which I actually really like. That thing is fascinating. For a web application, Many of our customers claim it's better than their locally installed Outlook or Apple Mail thing. It's pretty, I find this impressive. We do use some homegrown or modified plugins, but this is relatively minor. Um, last not least, to make use of the, the policy decision things and the authentication headers where the mail servers record whether DKM keys matched and the uh, signature is still valid. There's more than the technical bits, and I'll pick one example here. Um, the billing process is surprisingly complex, and I totally underestimated this 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, your billing also has to be largely automated because you're dealing with many small layer transactions. And the, the part that really surprised me is how far you have to delay generation of the actual invoice document. Um, the decision on which VAT rate, you know this is sales tax, essentially the same thing. Um, that decision is surprisingly complex. Um, first, it depends on whether you're selling goods or delivering a service. Selling goods is easy, delivering a service is not. If it's a service, if it's electronically delivered, 
an entirely different set of rules applies. This is a recent change. Thank you, Amazon. It is the Lex Amazon because Amazon served Europe from Luxembourg. So they only had to apply the Luxembourg VAT, which, surprise, is the lowest in the entire EU. And the other countries didn't like not getting any VAT bits. So <laughs> if it is a service, it's also um, what is the legal point of service delivery? And the legal point of service delivery is not necessarily what you think the point of service delivery is. This, <laughs> yeah, don't get me started. So in the end, the options are German VAT, 19%, or the EU reverse charge mechanism that basically means the customer is liable for VAT declaration with his government. And that has some medium complex rules attached to it. Or and this is the new bit for the Lex Amazon, the target EU countries VAT. Uh, well, dealing with the German tax authorities is one thing. And I'm not claiming I really like it. Dealing with 20, 28 tax authorities, yeah, right. They noticed that this doesn't really work for smaller companies and there's a workaround, but that surprise is super complex as well. And there's the case where the customer is outside the EU and then we usually get away without applying VAT. We also need automatic settlement of credit notes. When you do a credit note to a customer, it shall be automatically settled for the next invoice because if you don't do this, you have to do it manually, and manual work sucks. And a problem I had not foreseen years ago, you have to deal with credit from earlier overpayments. And overpayments typically come from countries where the customer tells us, yeah, well, you know, we don't have a working banking system. I have no idea which amount arrives on your side. So they overpay. And well, we got to deal with this. These customers are all either from the US or the UK. So not Africa. Africa works better. <coughs> it does. I'm sorry. It does. So next thing. In Europe, we have that, that thing called single European payments area, which improved things and brought us new problems. We have a thing called direct debit. Basically, customers can give us permission to fetch money from their accounts. And since that is obviously slightly risky, there's a lot of rules and a lot of legalese attached to that. So you gotta check, do we have a valid mandate? When did we use it last time? Because if you don't use it for three years, it expires and you have to get a new one. You have to decide on the debit date because you cannot just send this to be executed on the next day. You have to give your customer a warning, I think at least 14 days ahead. And the rules around the pre-notification are really, really hard and complex. So you have to do this all before generating the document because you have to print the, actually the legally mandated wording of the pre-announcements in the invoice. Do you offer PayPal to your customers? We don't do this to everybody. Is the language German or English? We don't support any other. Um, if the customer is outside the EU, uh, the, the IBAN and BIC don't cut it, so there's got to be much more details for them to be a maybe being able to make a bank transfer. Are we going to mail out the invoice on paper or just as a PDF? If we are going to mail it out, do we need a stamp? Well, to get a stamp, the interface Deutsche Post, the German former federal uh, postal system. The bad news is that interface is WSBL or SOAP. Even worse, I did not find an existing implementation I could use, so I had to deal with that. And well, <laughs> this crap never stops to amaze me. So in the end, you get a PNG file that has a QR code that you print on, on, on the invoice in the address field, right? So how hard can that be? The PNG they return, of course, sits inside, inside the zip file. I don't know why. Zip, not gzip. And that PNG comes with shit loads of white space around it. So I have to invoke in image magic to get rid of the white space. Don't ask. Deutsche Post. So finally, we are at the point where we can generate a PDF. Um, we use PDF LaTeX and our template engine. Um, the QR and barcodes in there are generated on the fly. This is really easy. Um, now, 
just generate a PDF doesn't really cut it. Companies in, I think it's the anti-AU, have to retain their invoices for 10 years. So that PDF should work if you open it in a PDF reader from 2026. We don't know how this is going to look. So fortunately, there is a standard for that. It's called PDFA for long-term archiving that basically denies all all dynamic content, all JavaScript shit in there, uh, requires you to embed all images and all fonts. We're using a subvariant called PDF A3B and I <laughs> actually had to modify things inside LaTeX to make this work. Um, submitted upstream, yes, so it'll be there soon. Um, our invoice PDFs contain structured billing data for automated processing. Some large clients start to mandate, most don't mandate it yet, but it's going that way. So basically, it's a little XML file embedded into the PDF. I didn't even know PDF can embe embed random other files before I deal with that. Oh. Yeah, now I know. Uh, the standard is called Zugpferd. I forgot what it stands for, it was something stupid. Um, it's a standard pushed by the German authorities. Yeah, that's a recipe for a good standard. By the German authorities to the EU authorities, uh, yes. And it's based on a standard by the United Nations. Uh, hmm. Suddenly, POSIX looks so easy. <laughs> Finally, when we are done with all that, the PDF goes into our document management system, is being emailed to the customer, and if it is being mailed out on paper, it's printed out. Woohoo, we are done. Well, wait a second, not yet. We do have to do some bookkeeping on our side. Foremost, to track payment status, not, not for the tax declaration part. Um, for incoming invoices, you've got to book them and put the PDFs in our document management system to make sure we retain them for 10 years at least. Um, we are at the point where we can handle some without any manual intervention, but most of them still come, come on dead trees, so they have to be scanned first. And eventually, we have to export all that to the tax advisor because I'm not going to implement all the tax rule stuff. Never, ever. <laughs> um, what we do ourselves is monthly pre-announcements because it actually turned out to be easier than running this through a tax advisor. Um, we need to interface with banks and PayPal. So I ported a tool called AQ Banking, which implements the protocols that the German banks implement to talk to them. We're using the usual PER modules for PayPal, and this was surprising. These PER modules implement basically each and every API call that PayPal knows, except for get balance. What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Isn't getting the balance of your account a pretty common thing? Well, so, <laughs> apparently not. So, I added that, it was not too hard, and yes, I submitted this upstream, and if the author manages to make a new release in the next five years, <laughs> <laughs> it's been two years ago, so uh, still no new release, but whatever. Um, for the banks, we have to send them these direct debit transactions and regular outgoing transfers. And for banks and PayPal, we have to retrieve transaction and balances. And of course, we have the regular pay with PayPal checkout process. Um, we want to match incoming payments largely automatic. Again, manual work is expensive. Um, that's easy for the transactions we generated, as in the direct debits. But for the transactions where the customers fill out the web form or the paper, well, paper doesn't exist anymore, but the web form, <coughs> the purpose field is free text. SIPA added an end-to-end -end reference, which is supposed to contain a unique number, well, end-to-end. -end. Customer specifies, we see it, the banks have no business in even touching that field. Guess what they do? So. Banks don't understand end-to-end. -end. They think every field is theirs. They even screw with the purpose field text. So um, we have to parse this and try to find something that looks like an invoice number, then figure out whether that exists and is still open, and whether the amount paid in that transaction matches the window. Wait a second, the window, it's not exact. No, if they are being late, there's late pay interest. If everything matches up, we book this automatically, if not, we leave it to a human. This is good enough, I didn't really run statistics, but I'm doing like two or three transactions manually a month. So 95%, 98% or so automatic. Obviously, for that host, talking to our banks and our PayPal account, 
security is quite critical, right? <laughs> that host is compromised, he has access to our bank, almost. But that is dangerous. Um, it also obviously has to be internet connected because that's how it communicates with the banks and with PayPal. And well, <laughs> I would not want to run that on Windows or Linux. So once again, OpenBSD security on that task is critical to us. Um, privacy regulations and data retention. I really just was looking for an excuse to use this awesome picture in my slides. Um, the European privacy regulations are really not an issue for us because our standards are way higher than what they mandate anyway. Um, for everything that goes into surveillance, including the data retention laws, we do the bare minimum that is legally permitted and try to make the data as useless as possible within legal constraints, of course. And we're being transparent about it. In practice, this is not a problem. We've never ever had a request from government agencies. We sometimes do have requests from police when two companies can't agree on <coughs> some trademark issue or something like that. But otherwise, Germany's government does what it does best, ignoring the problem. So, conclusions. I'm only 15 minutes over time. Um, using OpenBSD for all the core services really has paid out for us. Um, stability is awesome. We didn't have compromises. Security is critical to us. Um, what I keep stressing, it's been extremely efficient in terms of sysadmin time consumption, and that is the expensive resource. Stability has been awesome, performance good enough. I'm happy. I'm pretty much done. Allow me a little advertising plug for a new venture. And, well, then we are open for questions. Ooh. Ugh. Oh. Well,